does feel still a little odd to have some of the Boundary 2 meetings without Bill, who, of course, for a long time summoned them into being as well as after summon, summoning them into being would haunt them. Um, so, and I don't believe in specters and haunting, so I'm not thinking about that. It struck me as I was um, coming here that it's possible, and I think, in fact, I'm right about this, that I may be, of the people in this room, the person who knew Bill the longest. Um, I'll tell you just a very brief story as a way of getting us started. Um, Carol and I were married in uh, August of 1970 and moved to an apartment we had already prepared in Binghamton, a little town outside Binghamton called Endwell. And I went to register for my courses and met the director of graduate studies who at that time was a man named Sheldon Grebstein. And um, Grebstein looked at my undergraduate uh, career. I had the feeling for the first time and uh, saw that I had done not only English but also philosophy and said, well, if you want to do philosophy, you need to talk to Spanos. He's a little bit of a madman, but he does philosophy too. That was one of the many wrong things Sheldon Grebstein said in my presence over a number of years. <laughs> Not least because, of course, Bill never really did philosophy. Bill always did literature. Um, so I went to try to find the Professor Spanos, whom I had been warned was a madman. But he was working at home on Matthew Street. So I rang him up. Why not? And he said, uh, why don't you come over? Gave me his address. I went over, I rang the doorbell, he opened the door, short sleeves, beard, you know the image. As the door opened, waves of sound flushed over me, and it was Bach's great mass, just crescendoing around the house. So he said, come in! <laughs> uh, shook hands, went into his back study, which was a pine-covered walls filled with books and more crashing sound of Bach. The Bach went down. We talked for a long while about things that could be done. He offered me coffee. We moved into the kitchen. Um, he made coffee. I didn't want milk. He wanted milk. He could not find the milk. Mm -hmm. He shouted into the house, where is the milk? To which the response came, in the refrigerator, Bill. <laughs> and he said, oh, open the refrigerator and found the milk. So that was my first um, encounter with Spanos, a melange of not knowing where was the milk, uh, Bach flowing out of all the crevices, uh, already intense and heavy discussion about the fact that if I was going indeed to take his course in Yeats, Pound, and Eliot, uh, which was his way of introducing modernism, I would have to be prepared to do a lot of reading. I said, okay, fair enough. And then we sat and had coffee and talked about um, my sense of Eliot and Yeats and his sense of Eliot and Yeats. And for an entire semester, we realized that we didn't agree at all about anything regarding Yeats or Eliot, or more importantly, anything at all about how to read poetry. And I had two experiences in the class which have stood out in my mind from August through December of 1971. One was that after the first class, I realized that I had to change my habits and I needed two notebooks rather than one. And the second notebook filled merely with his passing references to everything that needed to be read in order to have the vaguest idea of what he was talking about. So I quickly filled the second notebook. <laughs> And uh, the first notebook, of course, was a record of the account of the class. Uh, and I developed the habit of writing marginalia to my own notes about my disagreements. And at the end of the class, I wrote a seminar paper, which he didn't like, in which I defended a very strong, high modernist, formal, spatialized reading of the uh, Yeats and Eliot. I, I persisted in ignoring the pound. And, uh, Essentially, his response to me was that this was a very good piece of writing, but it was completely wrong. And I hadn't understood a word he had said. Um, but we did another course the next semester. Eventually, the 
first year's paper that I wrote on irony was in the, one of the very early, I don't remember which, one of the very early issues of Boundary 2, even though it was a paper that both engaged with some of his issues, particularly Kierkegaard, and the problem of irony. Because uh, I read Kierkegaard's master's thesis, I remember, my first year in graduate school. Um, and although it fundamentally disagreed, I think, with some of Bill's basic positions, but he was characteristically generous in endorsing work that disagreed with his, that showed dialogue with his, that, as he told me, also showed improvement. <laughs> and uh, because he felt he wanted to clearly support and nurture me and my career, which he did for a very long time. Um, up to and including the embarrassing published debate, Chronicle of Higher Education or some such place, uh, around uh, Bill and uh, Edward Said and Carl Prober about my eventual hiring at Columbia and who was to be blamed for that particular uh, exercise or that particular event. So anyway, that's just to start with a series of series of comments. I've been asked now a couple of times to write about Bill since he died, and I have refused. And I don't, can't foresee in the, in the near future that I would do that. Uh, but there we are. I, I certainly hope other people will tell good stories. Maybe I'll step in next, because mine is very similar uh, to yours. I finished my undergraduate work at Stanford in 1970, went to Berkeley, finished a PhD in five years uh, with, um, I would say, um, uh, a less than finished education. But what was really interesting about it was that there was virtually no theory going on at Berkeley. So I came to Binghamton as an assistant professor in 1975, and I sat in on Bill's classes, mm -hmm. too. And I, like you, had a notebook with kind of two sorts of entries in it, and um, really listened to him for much of uh, at least two semesters on and off. Well, teaching one's own first classes and working out American literature from scratch and doing all of the things that new assistant professors do. And um, I think your account of him as a, as a teacher is absolutely uh, identical to what I experienced. Uh, there were students in the room who adulated him. And there still are on our campus people who revere him and who, whose lives are changed as a result of the thinking that he did. Um, but he didn't do dialogue in his classes. You kind of, it was like getting in a sled <laughs> that was going downhill really, really fast. <laughs> and you took notes as quickly as you could and hoped that later you would mm -hmm. understand uh, some of it. Um, so he broke fundamentally new ground. Um, you are the people in this room whose work he admired and respected most. And it's wonderful that you're here honoring him. So I arrived in Binghamton in 1972. Paul had already been there. And I mentioned when I arrived because when I received the news about Bill's death, my first, uh, the first thing that came to my mind was uh, how indebted I was to him, not just for my um, formal education, but also for my formation more generally. I don't think that anybody had a bigger influence in the way I and my life unfolded, uh, apart from my parents, then, then Bill Spanos. So I arrived in 72, Paul was one of my earliest friends, and I was completely befuddled by the American system. Um, my first semester I was forced to take Old English, <laughs> I was terrorized, therefore I worked very hard, 
So the professor of Old English simply assumed that I was going to do Old English. Then the same person Paul mentioned had me do American Lit since I didn't know much about it coming from Europe. And the very first presentation I did in class, which was about you know, Faulkner and problems of time, resulted in a, an outburst of fury. You're not dealing with literature, we're not interested in all this philosophy stuff. So. Um, and I met Bill Spanos, it was the spring, so my second semester. And, you know, I had studied philosophy in England and although I did study in England, I was fortunate that my professor of metaphysics uh, started his history, his course on metaphysics backwards, you know, so with Heidegger and worked all with that. So when I started to when I first met Bill, this was salvation. It was like we, we could talk about something in common. <laughs> and um, started going to lunch like Paul and others. And, you know. So in a way, independently of the intellectual uh, impact he had on, on me, there was this, for a person who always talked about Unheimlich, that he was the one who started making me feel at home. You know. Um, and of course that was the early years of Boundary 2 and so the second thing I learned was uh, generosity. He would get uh, um, manuscripts, he would find something interesting or valuable in them and he would devote hours of his own time making the work of others publishable, you know, in, in, in Boundary 2. And Thanks to that entire um, endeavor, people started, he, he would invite people, or people would come to Binghamton, give a talk and so on, and that enabled me to start, you know, knowing other people outside of Binghamton. And then within Binghamton, he had, uh, he was running a series of, um, I don't know what you'd call them, sort of uh, working papers. You know, people would, would go on, on an afternoon and would present a long paper and he would publish it in a little sort of pay, uh, du duplicated uh, form. And in the discussions uh, of those, uh, in, in the discussions that followed those presentations, it was remarkable uh, to, to witness the passion with which uh, Bill responded argued, questioned. Um, so that's the other uh, major factor uh, in, in my relationship or, you know, having the, the privilege of being uh, a student of his. Uh, and that was that he really made you realize that literature mattered so much to him, you know. And that if you, and so for me it was a question of if, if that's what you're going to do, it, it, you've got to embrace it with that passion and with that willingness to um, invest, not just abstract intellect to it, but, but yourself. So, he, you know, there was, my, my formation is owed enormous, uh, I owe enormous debt to them for it. And then over the years, of course, you know, the relationship grew, he remained generous, he uh, always supported my work. Um, whenever we met, he was curious about things and questioned and continued to argue, which was wonderful. So my, my memory is mixed with nothing but gratitude, really. So. It might be worth saying, too, that that's how the journal uh, <coughs> Expanded. Jonathan has commented, I think, on this in the past, that Bill was remarkably generous in welcoming younger Absolutely. colleagues. Do you, can you pick that up? Yeah, I, I, will, I will take it from there because um, of, of this group, I, I think I am, I am the one uh, senior in experience who was not a student or colleague of Bill's in the direct institutional sense, but only 
first met Bill by coming, my coming to Binghamton in a mediated way. Uh, and in speaking about that, I want uh, first to uh, read a poem about Bill by one of our, the group of those to whom Bill made a difference and uh, who made a difference for Boundary 2, Dan O'Hara, our friend, who cannot be here today because of uh, health reasons, but who, realizing he couldn't be here and that there was this occasion, uh, composed a poem uh, that, that I will read and I will continue after reading it to talk, uh, to talk a little more. So Dan O'Hara wrote, For Bill, loving futures. His voice spanned the room, any room. I saw him speak in a 300-seater once, and I swear the auditorium walls shook as he pronunciated each Greek syllable as distinctively as a small bomb. Metatophysica had no chance against being's voice. As well, his page ripped open with the cries of the unjustly dead. Bill would break open every settled case, making histories repeat their judgments under the scrutiny of the future. Theirs and ours, hearts tremoring open again, just like the plow cleaving the earth or the keel, the ocean, his voice evoked laughing Dionysus at his incessant song and dance until bloody thighs bare again. Dan O'Hara is actually the most immediate cause of my knowing Bill, and that is one reason I am immensely grateful to Dan. When Dan came to, uh, Pitts, uh, to Princeton in 1976 as a beginning assistant professor, I had been there for several years already, and we discovered interests in common, which led to Dan's telling me about this thing, Boundary 2, which I had memories of because actually in Widener Library I had handled, examined, inspected, and read some in the pages of Boundary 2-1-1 mm -hmm. back in 1972, but uh, I, I had not at that time persisted. But there was a place in my mind that <coughs> came alive when, when Dan uh, spoke of this. And he, he spoke of the, the code that Boundary 2 used to make sessions happen at the MLA. The term postmodern, which of course uh, from the founding of Boundary 2, uh, was carried out by Bill and Bob Croach, uh, Boundary 2, from its beginning, had a journal of postmodern literature. But postmodern was still, in the 1970s, not a term that the MLA knew what to do with. And so, in a way that's quite true to the practice of, of those days and still, but uh, nonetheless an elegant periphrasis or euphemism, we called the special sessions reconsidering modernism. And, uh, so it happened, and through, through Dan then, I soon met Paul, who was uh, an assistant professor at Columbia, and through their combined might, I came to Binghamton uh, in 1978 for a conference and, and began to know Bill. I, I have written about this in the Boundary 2 2015 issue uh, honoring Bill Spanos, so I won't say a great deal more uh, about the detail, but I will reiterate that the 
astonishing example from the beginning of my first knowing Bill, and uh, he was no, he was for me already an object of uh, fantasy in a way that uh, certainly the student reports we've just had didn't allow for. No, he was already a figure in in my mind, and he fully filled the figure and then some. For somebody educated at Harvard and beginning his career at Princeton, it was so important, so valuable, so inspiring, so nourishing to encounter a spectacularly engaging senior figure who cared about literature the way it needed to be cared about and who made it his work, not his only work, but an important work uh, to help to create not only through the magic of print, but through the magic of conversation, uh, a community of those who differently shared that care. And the, the generosity, the, the insight, the, uh, the outreach, all, all of the things that made it possible for Bill to gather around him an ever larger number of uh, young people, younger than him, uh, who shared something uh, of what he was offering, uh, has helped to feed the whole life that has brought me to this table. And I'm deeply grateful. The, some of my closest friends, some of whom are at this table, I owe to Bill. And uh, many, many of my most uh, cherished thoughts arose in dialogue, sometimes immediate, sometimes reflective, and long after the fact with Bill. I remember correctly, too, the, the way in which Don King along was through <coughs> Jonathan's mediation from a meeting in Chicago. Yeah, this was in 1979. We were, we were gathered, that is, B2 was gathered under Cornell West's wings at Union Theological Seminary. Mm -hmm. I said, I know this guy in New York who, or <laughs> sometimes in New York. Who, right, and suddenly there was Don in the audience while Corn was mm -hmm. giving a talk. Uh, the, the immediate context was um, Derrida speaking at the University of Chicago. He delivered a talk titled The Law of the Genre. And I asked a pretty intense question from the floor because I thought he was um, generating a militaristic logic um, in relation to the law and genre. And um, Jonathan came up to me afterwards and said, uh, I think you like to continue this conversation with friends uh, in the Boundary 2 group, uh, and I'm forever grateful to Jonathan for that uh, suggestion. <coughs> uh, we did gather in, in New York, and uh, Cornell West gave a talk on Kierkegaard, and uh, Bill uh, gave a talk on, on repetition. And I, I realized at, 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 uh, in listening to those talks um, that this was a moment in which the academy was transposing a certain kind of philosophical um, interrogation of matters of anxiety and dread and through the anxiety of influence was transposing them into institutional logics that had a double bind uh, linked to them. I, I realized that Bill, in other words, uh, had um, maintained a relationship within the academy at a time in which the academy was uh, generating its strongest excessive sense of institutional bonds as if they were deeply related to the interrogation of literature. Uh, and he had um, a mode of thinking that while within the academy uh, was not ever of it, uh, that is, his, his thinking had not only produced uh, a, uh, a disposition that could not be captured by the academy, 
uh, but uh, that he had, uh, through this disposition, um, enabled a sense of a conversation uh, that was para-academic uh, and that maintained its paradoxical relation to the academy by way of uh, the construction of affective uh, mechanisms uh, that were linked to deep philosophical traditions. But also, I realized, you know, because at this time I was uh, trying to figure out uh, some of um, um, the ways in which I've been transposed into a citizen of the United States through uh, dread. I used to have nightmares constantly about nuclear uh, attacks and uh, um, I um, wanted to turn that kind of uh, thinking into a way of bringing American studies uh, into relation to um, what, what I call um, the, the moods of um, uh, dread, anxiety, uh, that, that Bill had uh, gone all the way to the core of. And uh, for me, the, the, the deepest uh, moment in my academic life um, moment that uh, Bill took an argument about the Cold War and the tradition of American literature, specifically uh, Melville, and turned that into the basis for a deep disagreement that also had a deep bond. Um, it, with, with Bill, uh, the, 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 the reason, I think, for the intensity of um, dialogical engagement uh, was not to develop disciples um, and not to develop uh, acolytes, um, but to draw out of um, the person with whom he was in conversation uh, what addressed that person at, at, at the level uh, of complete discomfort uh, with being in the world at all. And uh, that became the, the locus for um, uh, a, a relationship that um, was always brought to life not by, um, you know, friendship or um, the kind of um, uh, fatic uh, hellos, but when he really disagreed or wanted to take something with which he agreed to another level. Um, when, when I uh, was coming up with a theory of American exceptionalism, um, we uh, bonded not because he uh, <coughs> agreed at all with um, the theoretical claims about the exception, but because he agreed about the, the locus for the thinking of, of, about uh, this. And um, we, we were in, you know, every time I, I read work uh, that uh, he wrote, when he decided to bring uh, the Heideggerian uh, speculative mode of thinking into relation with the uh, Foucauldian and Saidian um, ontopolitical mode of thinking. Um, that, that intersection was uh, the locus for um, our ongoing meetings at that crossroads. Uh, and uh, that crossroads was uh, a site we always uh, return to again and again. And uh, so uh, when uh, he published that memoir um, uh, in, uh, in, in which he said he was able to take all the scaffolding uh, away from his experience um, uh, 
after the firebombing of Dresden and realized that the being who had been brought to life there, the being of, in absolute dread, uh, was the being who then returned uh, who, with the sense that he had to, with almost a kind of existential survivor guilt, um, communicate what he had experienced at that moment um, in order to um, not only justify being alive, uh, but in order to allow persons who had, who shared the condition of radical homelessness, which is the core of dread, a, a way of being with it, through it, as it. Um, and uh, for that, um, you know, the, uh, we have a uh, many, many uh, lifetimes of conversation. We are almost by accident following sort of the history of the journal <laughs> as a way of talking about Bill, and that's not completely coincident. Uh, the story then would have to shift because we had a um, we had one wave of expansion, as it were. Uh, and then we had, the journal had a crisis, which was also a crisis in some ways for Bill, which was the shifting of the journal that he had been so hardworking to identify from Binghamton and his hands, largely because of the refusal of the State University to continue the funding. Uh, to Duke University Press, which aroused considerable anxiety precisely in the terms that we're talking about here because the uh, sale, as it were, of the journal's identity by allowing Duke to acquire the copyright made the, uh, raised the stakes, made it much harder to remain para-academical, as it were, right? And we managed to negotiate, I think, a reasonable solution to that problem that sustained the editorial independence and identity of the journal over and against the property rights that Duke had in it. So for a while, there was a hiatus in the journal's expansion <coughs> and development, but undoubtedly there were changes, and particularly the change away from the subtitle of post journal of postmodern literature. We've never really quite been happy, I think, with any particular subtitle. Uh, for the journal and in the profession, of course, the journal is increasingly simply referred to as B2. So it's a, even Duke sometimes does that in branding. But when uh, the journal moved to uh, Pittsburgh and Duke, um, we had an opportunity to emulate Bill's desire to uh, develop the reach of the journal and to make the journal a home resource for people who wanted to do similar but different things, people who could enrich what was already being done, not only by uh, augmenting things on the scale that existed, but also by extending the range of knowledge and concerns. Saying that means really that we're going to talk, we have to talk about the futurity of things too. So I think we should mention, we should let Ronald speak here because he has been, he was the first and most senior appointment, I believe, after the shift to uh, Duke, correct? Yes, yes I think yes, so. Yes, yes. And Tony, not long after, and uh, I've also asked Tony, who has happily, for my sake, accepted the task of reflecting upon what Bill's practice and commitment mm -hmm. might mean going forward from now. So there are multiple uh, chronotopes here, and um, the Binghamton Duke shift uh, entailed with it a certain sense of the future as well as a history. Uh, Donald will forgive me for saying this, that at the time he was one of the markers of the shift and the times and the change in the future. And, and Tony, having joined not long afterwards, is, is, has accepted the task of talking about yet another future or a persistent future. And in this case, I'm also extremely regretful that um, no one of the younger new generation 
colleagues, particularly the young women who have joined the journal in the last several years, was able to be here today or stayed on. Um, that absence uh, allows this, the image of this group here to persist, which is, of course, fair enough, since Susan will allow me to say this, this is the, the old male formation of the journal. So Bill's invitations, we need not say this, but we should have nonetheless. We're all too smart young white guys um, for various complicated reasons. So anyway, what, what would you like yes, to yes, say? Yes, yes, yes. That's very well put because uh, um, before I talk about when I first met Bill, uh, I very much for him embodied that new shift and that embodiment from the basis of our personal interactions. Bill's profound curiosity, he wanted to figure this out, resulted in, in uh, a really remarkable uh, generosity inviting me here, sending me gifts, trying to figure out what this means. I met Bill Spanos for the first time here. I, I do not have dates ready at hand in the way the rest of you do, but I believe it was around 1991. Mm -hmm. I was brought into the journal, as Paul says, at his invitation, having met him in 85, through my then uh, advisor, Lev Godzic. Uh, I wanted to do philosophy. I wanted to do continental philosophy, having an undergraduate degree in Islamic philosophy. And I was interested in comparative epistemologies. And at Minnesota, I was told if I was going to do that, I had to go work with this guy named Godzic, who still did that stuff called hermeneutics and existentialism. And Godzic told me, uh, in preparation for that Boundary 2 meeting, which was my first Boundary 2 conference, that I should listen to this fellow, Bill Spanos, uh, because of uh, my interest in Heidegger, an interest that Gods had shared as well. So I gave a paper here that led to his fastest limping. And I was a young man, and I had this proclivity of taking a 30-minute talk and turning it into an hour. <laughs> and apparently with sufficient enough style and, and fervor that nobody left the room. When Bill spoke, I discovered we had that in common. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he held forth for, it was really 90 minutes, on a reading of Melville infused with a particular deployment of Heidegger's critique of, of, of uh, ontology. And I found while I agreed precisely with the critique on ontology, I disagreed profoundly with the celebration of Heidegger. And that began our arguments. Uh, what always astounded me about Bill Spanos is the more we argued and the more we disagreed, the more he insisted on talking to me. Judy, what are you thinking? Uh, and we had many lively arguments about uh, hum humanism and Heidegger, and also about things Greek, which I was fascinated with. And uh, he detected a particular bond, which, which I always found rather uh, uh, pathetic in the most positive sense, that is to say, affective. Yeah. He was this Greek boy from Vermont, talking to this, this, this black kid from Minneapolis with a mixed ethnic heritage, and they both loved Greek philosophy. <coughs> we were brothers. And it was discovered that we both loved Bach and Coltrane, and believe it or not, Van Morrison. And I still have CDs that he would send me <laughs> of Van Morrison. Slipstream is one of the songs we shared in common. And indeed, he invited me here, and I spent two days here in his house, which is an amazing place, full of books, in, in wonderful disarray, and cigarette smoke, which I'm allergic to, but for some reason I paid no attention to it for those two days. And she, he, he took great effort to help me understand that this journal was supposed to be dead. That it was only to last for five years to make a very important political intervention along the lines that Don has talked about. And he was trying to sort out the significance of the fact that it was continuing and what I was doing there. 
And of course, I realized that the point of the story was to, to burden me with a certain heritage, right? To welcome me in to the fold, but in welcoming me in, make me aware, give me knowledge, right, of what it had been about. We had an argument that weekend about Tunisia and about Byzantium, because I made a passing comment about the, uh, the Arabic meaning of the term Rome, which referred to the Greco-Roman, it referred to what we call Byzantium, and how that region extended all the way to the Algerian border. And he told me nonsense. I didn't know what I was talking about in emphatic terms. And I said, no, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. And that's how, <laughs> that's how that weekend ended. And then I had the, the, uh, the wonderful opportunity to invite the boundary to, to Tunisia in 1999. Uh, and uh, Bill came, and uh, during uh, that trip, we toured the old city, and I made a very specific point of taking the B2 group to a set of, of, of shops in the old city of Kasba, uh, in the Sleha, where, where there was a plethora of Byzantine tiles, right? And you could see uh, uh, the Zaytun Mosque from a couple of these roofs and see the repetition of these titles that they were commonplace. And then, of course, took them to the board of the museum. And he says, Judy, this is all Byzantine! <laughs> <laughs> Which is the closest I ever got to an apology. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, you're right. <laughs> we uh, had a, a brief moment of tension around the issues Paul mentioned. But, but um, um, I was very pleased, serendipity, that years ago, just out of the blue, which is sort of a lie, I missed the arguments, I, I reached out to them in a brief email, and the, uh, the uh, respectful enthusiasm of the response um, stopped me dead in my tracks, uh, uh, and it put all things in perspective also going to Greece and meeting other Greeks put it in perspective that, that, that all of that was about, uh, um, and I don't know the right word for it, it isn't quite agape, which I think is a term he would <laughs> dispute or philia, but a certain, a certain kind of profound uh, secular love and care that, that opened the question of the human. So we had a brief exchange <coughs> that I'm glad that that we, we, we indeed have. This is a mind. I say is, because I'm of the, I'm of the mind that the ancestors are always with us. They remain with us, dynamically, in the way they always have been, in the relations that are narrative we have amongst ourselves. So this is a mind that is, in, is still very important precisely because of the way in which Bill persisted in challenging any facile conception of the human. I think our last argument was in uh, Nanjing in 2005. One of the topics he and I argued about was his reading of Edward Said, which I still think is absolutely wrong. And I gave a presentation on uh, the then posthumously published book, Democratic uh, in which I uh, said that this was aligned with Fanon's sense of radical music. The explosion that that set off in that room was um, almost as much as the, he used to talk to me a lot about Dresden, <laughs> the bombs. <laughs> oh, humanism, what is, <laughs> those are my memories of, 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 of Bill, of Bill Spanos. I, I see him in my mind, although I never saw him begin there in this way, <clears throat> but standing on the beaches of Malibos in shorts and bare arms, his big beard, a slightly soiled t-shirt, laughing at the sea. The Nanjing conference was, of course, mm -hmm. I want to say Crocs, that's not right. It was a breaking point. 
that um, brought to a head uh, a crisis marked by the general turn of the journal away from the um, ontological levels of discussion, which had been associated so powerfully in its pages with Heidegger, but not only. Um, I think the, Joe will remember, I'm sure, because he was also there, took part in the intensity of this argument. But what was not really an argument, we have to use the less polite word, fight. Yeah. In Nanjing, because the problem of humanism, so to speak, was for uh, Bill Align not to be crossed. It was a step too far, because he understood humanism as the ontological obstacle to all the good things that he aspired to. And in fact, our strongest intellectual break came precisely over this account that he gave of Said absorbing. And we all read this paper, I think, and found the position indefensible. Uh, in response to the Nanjing crisis, Bill wrote an essay that convinced none of us that properly read Edward Said's book on democratic humanism was a Heideggerian exposition <laughs> and a critique of the ontological theological <laughs> tradition. And we all said, what? <laughs> you know, this, this, this simply, this, this is a step too far. And uh, what went, what was um, the disagreement become crisis become fight became fatal. Um, and Bill in a rage and fury, which was perfectly justified, um, decided he could not continue to go forward with us. And I think in part of that decision was um, because he didn't like the implications that existed in our decision for what the future of the journal would be because he felt we were losing a sense of critical engagement and giving way to some kind of positivist concern with getting it right, which was for him a kind of academic issue. Whereas our interest in the Saidian thought about the human and about democracy was more important collectively than the persistence of the ontotheological critique, which we felt didn't reach to the right place where we wanted to go. And in a sense, Ronald's statement about himself as bringing the question of the human in every way possible into the debate and prepared the ground for that discussion or in that crisis, that separation. So I, but the question does remain, what's, what is to be taken from Bill going forward? Right? Yeah. And Tony joined not long after Ronald. And in fact, I should add to this, by the way, just, just to say on the side, that is, I believe your, your coming on also had to do with coming here. Mm -hmm. Right, is that not right? Yeah, Don. Because we, Don brought Tony in, and you gave a wonderful talk, and Joe and I went walking along the road up here, as I recall, and said, what a wonderful talk, that's the, that's the real thing. That was, uh, <laughs> what was it, 1999? Yeah. Maybe. To the 19th, I, I, don't I, I don't remember. Um, Nine years after us, I don't remember. Um, what I do remember is uh, is uh, Don please invited me um, here. Um, Sorry. And, uh, I remember uh, saying yes to Don because I had um, by that time, you know, brief meetings which. Um, were around Sailor James and Miners were here and Castaway, so you're republishing of that. Um, I had um, developed an enormous respect, so if Pete asked me to do something, I would still do. Uh, I, say, I, said, um, I said, okay. The, and when I joined uh, Boundary 2, it was. Um, it, it, Bill was, uh, 
was a spectre. <laughs> I know Paul doesn't like it, but I, I, I didn't come to the first meeting I came, but everybody talked about the Spanish in one way or the other. Um, um, in, uh, everybody, he was a reference point um, as student, as founder, one of the founders of the journal. Um, but also, I think, as, a, as a, somebody who had an enormous intellectual influence on the journal. And uh, so I made it one of my tasks to essentially find out who was this best man <coughs> that's coming from the Caribbean. And um, so, who, you know, who was Spanish? And I read a couple of things. Um, and I saw his engagement with, with Heidegger. I myself had a different engagement, but I understood, um, I think, what he was, what he was trying, to, uh, trying to do. But one of the things I, I took from him when I met him a couple of times that when he was here, he, uh, I think he was kind of withdrawing, but he would come to a couple of meetings. Um, and one memorial meeting, I think, was here in, 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 in Dharma, um, was that he had a, a certain passion, and, and people have talked about it, but to, for me, it was, a, it was really a passion about life. It was, it was a life-affirming passion. And, and that is, is in, in a moment of, of death, of, 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 of life being reduced to a certain um, calculus that has to do with, with markets and, and so on, and, and certain kind of false rationalities. Um, I found that passion for life quite refreshing because it, it, it meant that there were high stakes to what he thought, and that the stakes were not just about, uh, were not uh, about the academy, was not about careers, was about really that ideas mattered. And they mattered in the most profound way, because uh, they, if we didn't have them, then the question of, what kind of world we should live in really doesn't really did matter. And so that the passion was not so much for me of certain generosity and care, but a passion that and I heard him shout at people and so on and so forth, but it didn't quite try to bother me because I thought that the, you know that was an expression of a certain um, a certain a certain way in which one needs to engage the world. Um, and uh, that there was no neutrality in that engagement. So even if he was wrong, it didn't matter, right? The, 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 um, you know, the, the stakes were high, and therefore you had to give it all you had. You had, um, and if that meant shouting at some people and whatever. Then that's what it meant. And, and then, but but the good for me, the good, it, it, I noticed that the shouting did not mean I would not talk to you again. Mm -hmm. the, the shouting was like a, a moment, it, and, and therefore, sometimes to me it, it, it seemed like a theater, like you know, a certain theater, you know, certain rhetorical theater to make a point, to engage you, to make a point, and then we move on, and we move on after. Um, I, I think, and this is, you know, I mean, I didn't know him as I, was, as I said, not a student of his and so on, um, in a formal sense. But I actually think that coming out of Dresden and coming out of um, <coughs> this world, Second World War, that what we are looking at is one of the most important critical intellectuals of the of the, of the mid and late 20th century. Um, and that doesn't mean one agrees again with everything that he says or that he, he, he did. And I say that because, and I use the word critical intellectual, it's not academic, not scholar, because I think for him the question of the being a critical intellectual was that how to develop thinking that could intervene thinking that mattered, and for mm -hmm. it to matter, it had to, you, one had to be able to intervene. Hence the journal. And hence the journal for only five years. <laughs> because, right. because 
because in a very funny way, for him, I think, thinking is very much uh, conjunctural in terms of what is how you intervene at a specific moment. So that after that moment has passed, then why do you want to, why do you want to continue? But he also, I think, has something which, which I think he was deadly afraid of, which was that, and just listening to him talk, and I had long conversations with him, the one time I went to Binghamton to give a talk um, a couple of years ago, um, was that it's, was that if you, if you stayed where you are, that is, you produce something and it continues for a very long time and institutionalize itself, then the actual process of institutionalizing itself guts it on what it is. And therefore, the question of renewal becomes extremely difficult. Uh, and I don't think he believed in renewal in that sense. I think he believed in renewal into, uh, when you do something else. Right, and so I, 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 I think therefore that for him it was therefore hard to, to say okay what next and, and you know really do we want to renew and if renew on what conditions or do you not want to do something else? That then brings me to what Paul had asked me to say. I just you know which is which is really too formidable a task quite frankly for one person, um, and what. What I would say is this, <coughs> that if one is thinking about a certain practice, a Spanonian practice of being a critical intellectual, then, uh, and, and, and trying to think about the journal, then it would seem to me that one has to think through, not just, not, okay, how do we expand, um, but that the, the, the business of expansion is contingent upon a way in which what is it that the journal is supposed to do at this moment of neoliberalism which has kind of morphed into a kind of authoritarian populism um, political formation um, both in America and elsewhere. So what does what do committed critical intellectual scholars do when you have a journal in this particular moment, and that's how I understand. That's that's how I understand it. So I mean, I would, for me, it is not so. Okay, the journal needs to do this to expand, and here's a kind of laundry list. It's more to think. Okay, this is the moment we are in. This is we are all committed to explain, understanding that moment, grappling with it, quarrelling with ourselves about it, you know, um, uh, thinking about, um, you know, just for me thinking about trying to think about f the ways in which empire and Don describes fantasy as a certain kind of process of interpolation of subjects today in a certain way that allows us to have a kind of authority, have authority of populism, not just here but elsewhere. So what do you do? And what do you do as a journal that is committed to, to literature and culture but literature and culture are also questions of politics. Um, and so, to me, in the spirit, if you want to think about Spanish or something like that spirit, one then has to think about the moment we are in, mm -hmm. what has caused the, the ground for that moment, uh, for, 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 for that moment, that is ideological, discursive um, level, um, how is it expressed and so on. Um, and then to think about I don't like to think about futures because I keep on, every time I think about futures, I, I keep on remembering Marx who would run you out of the room if you came <laughs> to him and talk about futures. And I agree with him because I think futures are not made in our head. I think they're made with, with, with people uh, in conversations and dialogue. But really, it's trying to understand the present. Um, and, and, and therefore not try to understand the present for both futures and everybody's talking about future to a lot of people and not everybody but really trying to think through um, the, what the present is um, and I think Bill's legacy to us if, there's an, if we can use that word is really then trying to think hard about that present and what kind of formation journalistic uh, journal formation as scholars we can actually create to meet the demands of the time. Thank you, Tom.
I think I'd like to sort of say thank you and a couple of other things. I completely agree with Ronald that the spirit of the ancestors remains. Um, I think Bill would be very happy to have, have heard this. Um, I want to give you a slightly altered Bill, and it's one um, that emphasizes the extent to which he actually changed over time. He read every single one of your work. Uh, as you know, his first, uh, his first work was on Christian existentialist verse drama, T.S. Eliot. Uh, he, he never let go of Heidegger, and I had many arguments with him, probably several of you did as well, that, I mean, right. think about what Heidegger right. did to Hannah Arendt and the right. Me Too right. movement and how, right. how that would play. Um, without Heidegger, he, he would have been free to, I think, fly in directions that might have been even, even more interesting and productive. But it was as though that Heideggerian ontology was a kind of bedrock on which he built. And when he thought he needed to go there first, and his essays frequently go back there first, and then construct uh, something new. But he died two days before his 93rd birthday, and he changed so many times. He became a new Americanist after reading Don's work. Uh, he, he spoke about each of you with um, passionate uh, fanship and, and dedication to the, to the work that you had done. Um, if, if each of us changes and grows intellectually as much as he did, uh, I think we will be um, addressing today and responding to it in ways that are important and productive. Lovely, thank you, thank you. Teaching is such a complicated story. Um, I agree with your general characterization that Bill did not run a dialogic seminar. I sat in his <coughs> seminar on Beckett, I think just before I went to Columbia. And it was, by that time, he was well enough known that people would come from New York City and so on and so on, just to sit in the seminar. And um, we had developed this strange Avon Costello routine, um, which is to say, he would be halfway through a sentence and he would look to me to finish the sentence for him in the room. And he really didn't seem to care if anyone else in the room was taken away. Are you going? No. Um, so I would say that his. Um, goodbye. Thank you both. See you soon. Uh, his. Um, His pedagogy was inseparable from his thinking. I'm not saying, saying he did not care about his teachers. On the contrary, he cared not necessarily about all of his students, though. That's very interesting. Uh, which is not to say he didn't read everyone's paper carefully and correct it and so on and so forth. But in the room of the, th of the theater of the seminar, it was the thinking aloud which sometimes, if you recall, would lead him to pause. I mean, he came with his notebooks, and he could give the seminar from his notebooks because he was, in fact, writing for hours before he came to the seminar. So he would be giving the seminar, which would mean he was correcting his manuscript as giving the seminar. He would pause and write his emendation. So it was the this, this scene of instruction, to use the Bloomian term, was the seminar, at least in the 70s, it was the seminar, where he was still discovering many things. And I, I say this because, again, this is the advantage, the advantage of having been there earlier than some of the rest of you, or all of the rest of you. That is, I was there before there was Heidegger. <laughs> it's kind of hard to imagine a Spanos before there was Heidegger. <laughs> um, 
But uh, if, you, if you recall his teaching at Knox College, his teaching at uh, whatever the so expensive New Hampshire boys' school was, Mount, where, Herman. Mount Herman, right, where Edward Said had been a student, and so on and so forth. Uh, and you, you know his intellectual engagements there after the war, they were with Christian theologians, they were with jazz musicians, they were with existentialist novelists and playwrights. What, one of the texts that stands out in my mind as a kind of crisis text in many interesting ways was, uh, I'm even not now sure it was ever published, it was an over 100 page long essay on Tolstoy's Death of Ivan Illich. Yeah. Is it published? I can't remember. It is published. In its early version, its first version, which I read while he, which he wrote while he was in Greece on some Fulbright or something, or the south of France maybe, his wife sometimes, pretty often. And uh, he sent it to me in those days by mail and Xerox paper. I had no Heidegger in it. But then he became aware of being in Times, use of, in Science Zeit, the use of the death of Ivan Illich. But that didn't make the essay become Heideggerian. What made the essay become Heideggerian was the full emergence in the US of deconstruction as a dominant modality, which became a kind of competitive way of regulating reading and the purposes of engagement with literature. So the Ivan Illich essay was recast in a Heideggerian mode of destruction over and against the Demonian, specifically the Demonian position on deconstruction. It was then sent at 100 pages to the PMLA, which needless to say, wasn't going to publish 100 pages. But they were, in rejecting it, they sent back Paul Demon's reader's report, which was several pages long, <laughs> single-spaced engagement with the essay. So the essay had struck And for a long time, as I recall, it never appeared. I mean, it appeared fine. I don't actually remember ever seeing it in print. So that in the journal criticism? But not surely the whole thing. Not, probably not the 100 pages. So that, you know, that was a kind of uh, interesting moment to watch. Because there, there was a, the para-academic meant the academic was still important. Because the seriousness of ideas required engagement, even in purely academic terms. Sending to the PMLA, for God's sake, right? Uh, because so much was at stake, right? But sometimes the engagement led to an arming, and then the arming couldn't easily be let go of because it became the armature of work. And that's what we used to argue about. And the, the, we all remember the metatafusica, right? Metatafusica from 1970 and so on and so forth. Right? Just saying metaphysics? Ah, yes, yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> but for, for us, it was always the German Heideggerian phrase, aus ein andersetzen, right? Which was our way of being in dialogue and conflicted interest. And I would strongly refuse that word because I sometimes, as Bill's Example vis a vis Demand through Heidegger's reading of this is such a Spanish thing, right? You, how do you engage with Demand and deconstruction? By doing a Heideggerian reading, which recasts the death of Ivan Illich in more Heideggerian terms than Heidegger himself, in order to displace deconstruction. So for Bill, that was Aus ein Andersetzen, but for me, that was not what was needed, Aus ein Andersetzen. And that was the problem, really, about the Said Heidegger essay. There was no aus ein andersetzen that was possible there. It was a yes or no. And the question became, the answer became finally no. So there's no talking across that. And this is to pick up on the idea that precisely, I wouldn't say there was ability to fly more without that grounding. The grounding was essential, including to the Melville books, I think, right? But, um, any kind of base of that sort is also ties you down. It drags you. It, it keeps you in a place. And it, I argued with him about the seriousness of this because I thought it was unfortunate to, for him that he should tie himself 
to that space. I'm really glad you were here, Susan, and, and shared that. And I, and I strongly agree with uh, what Tony said about the conjunctural, which is linked to what Paul has just said about the demand. It was a conjunctural intervention mm -hmm. that was very important to him. And he never, uh, to my thinking, held on to demand. No. But he needed. Uh, uh, and this has been a great occasion. And I'm really glad that. Uh, There's one more person who would like to say something. Any discussion from the floor? I'd like to say something, yeah. Uh, would, could, you, could you come forward for the ease of the camera? So I was thinking about uh, something that's really important um, to me. Uh, starting publishing adventures. So starting Boundary 2 is really an important thing. I, I had the pleasure of visiting uh, Bill's house once to, with Joe and uh, Paul, and it was like being in the way. <laughs> this is like Santa Claus's workshop here, but these are all books. Uh, and he was pulling those Christian humanist, his early stuff, that's, that's, which I had not known about. And everything was there, it was physically there, so you could, uh, and I said, Bill, what's this thing doing here? And what's this box of journals doing here? Um, but when I think about the 1960s, I think, you know, it's a time when things started, uh, but not that many journals started, and not that many colleges or universities started. I mean, Hampshire College started, um, but the trick is having, but it's great when they do start, and over the last thousands of years of human life, when people start institutions, whether that just means stacking up rocks that stay in place for a couple of years uh, or not, it doesn't matter. But you have to have you have to have institutions that can renew themselves. So um, this boundary two is an institution that has renewed itself. Uh, uh, and I suppose as, I, as I'm listening, I'm thinking, well, I was one of the people who um, helped organize that meeting in Nanjing, um, and I'm. Um, and that meeting in Nanjing where this dispute uh, discussion took place uh, was, was really important. And the shift that Boundary 2 made when it could become, I mean, Boundary 2 was always meant to be global, but so how are you going to be global? Uh, is the, and were you really global or is that just, is that just words? But having the meeting in Nanjing, and both Jonathan and Paul worked at, uh, in Hong Kong for various, various times, um, but including Wang Wei in the operation is really an important, important change. And for me, the, sh the shift towards, um, towards humanism, I suppose this is a shift away from Bill's interest, but that's a shift. I'm, a couple of years after that Nanjing conference, I organized a conference at Harvard on humanism from Florence to Shanghai. Um, and a number of people uh, involved with Boundary 2 came to that meeting. But, so starting things, keeping them going, keeping them going means renewing them. So that's the, and I know that uh, the editors of Boundary 2 are working really hard to figure out ways of renewing the journal. I once read uh, a line for, there's this great publisher, German publisher named Peter Zorkamp who said, probably every publishing house should just exist for 30 years, just the span of one generation. Um, and so it's always, I mean, I happen to work for a publishing house, which is kind of theirs till that place is, gets carried away down the river. But, um, but, 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 uh, <laughs> but, um, but that's different. That's different from publishing houses like, uh, like Zurcomp or Random House. Uh, so the question is, how can you, renew yourself beyond that 30 year span. And it seems, I feel, and see in the activities of the people involved with the journal, an effort to, uh, to do that. If I could just say one other thing, this is again to return us to Bill from 1970. I began by saying that although we were disagreeing all the time, he was generously supportive and nurturing, which means he was offering himself and any other resource he had 
in order to have a younger person, in this case, uh, be able to do what's possible. Uh, my sense one of the journal now and in recent years is that it's not a response in the same way to a crisis. It is rather in an era of austerity which has damaged the humanities greatly. The journal is um, as a result of historical circumstances which are contingent and fortuitous. It is a reservoir of resources that it's important to make judiciously available to people who have the opportunity and the ability to make good use of them. And we make the call on the utility and value in part by responding to the question of whether or not the work that's done is addressing the present, or even to adapt, if, you're, if you will accept this phrase, even to adapt Edward Said's notion that what we have to do in order to make is to imagine alternative futures as well. So Leah Feldman, who had to leave early this morning, and our more senior colleague, Amr Mufti, one person from Budapest, the other person from Pakistan, are cobbling together for a boundary to a, a special issue which will appear in a year or so on this new authoritarianism as precisely arise from the neo-populism, but they're treating it as something vis-a-vis -vis the US that comes from the East. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at Turkey, Central Asia, Russia, which is to say that to know where we are in the present, we need to know lots of things. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, to go back again to where I started, which is with the second, which Susan meant strongly, which is the need for the second notebook with Bill. <laughs> Especially I found in those Speaking early notebooks. days, the second notebook was essential because it was the instantiation, the lectures were the instantiation of the things you, you needed to know, which were long historical things as well as everything possible in the axis of contemporaneity. So. Are we okay? okay. I just wanted to add one quick thing. Yes. Um, as a young graduate student. Do you want to come? Do you want to okay, come? Please, Carol, sure. please come. As a, a young graduate student at uh, Binghamton, uh, Bill um, had asked me to translate some uh, works by Serge Dubrovsky and Hélène Sixou. And so that had an important formative influence on me, and I was grateful to uh, be involved in that, and it certainly had. Uh, a uh, strong impact, a lasting impact on my own work, uh, but also his personal pres presence, his, mm -hmm. his warmth, uh, his friendship was very important to, to many of us. And I'm sure my life would be very different if it hadn't been for Bill Spanos, which makes me think that institutions, what really makes institutions valuable is the individuals uh, who are part of them, uh, because it seems to me that in the university is where you can uh, at least potentially find uh, some kind of community. Susan may remember, I think, if I remember correctly, Susan, Carol, and Bill and I went to dinner in New York City in the late 1970s, right, to a restaurant called Le Cheval Blanc, where we ate a wonderful meal. It was on the east side. And we looked at the watch and realized we were going to be very late for the opera over at Lincoln Center. You remember that? And we, we ran from the east side to Lincoln Center <laughs> um, after a very heavy French meal. And uh, we, we arrived to see the dialogue of the Carmelites being sung in French uh, with the remarkable uh, French soprano Régine Crespin as the first priors. And if you know how that opera ends, with an astonishing scene of uh, decapitations at the guillotine. They decapitate all the nuns at the guillotine uh, during the revolution. And uh, the opera ends with the nuns singing in choir the Te Deum. So here, as the, as the guillotine falls, you hear <laughs> in the cymbals, and the roar of the crowd somewhere in the distance, and the chorus thins by a voice until finally there are no more voices and everything's quiet, except the one novitiate who has escaped, standing dressed in her civvies in the crowd, and she, she raises her voice in the Te Deum. <laughs> they come and take her away. The music rises, silence, her voice carries. <laughs> Dead silence. 
Nothing moves, nothing. Bill lets out, that's just great! <laughs> <laughs> Which was his enactment of the Aristotelian catharsis. <laughs> the curtains fell on Bill's, that's just great. <laughs> so there's outside on the <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much and thank you, Bill.